Yeah, it's really interesting. So you never want to go viral when you're in the White House, particularly if you're someone very few people know, someone named Brian Deese, who's the economic advisor in the White House. Well, he went viral. Watch. They say that this could be a long ye a war measured in years. And I think everybody understands why this is happening. But is it sustainable? What do you say to those families who say, listen, we can't afford to pay four eighty five a gallon for months, if not years. This is just not sustainable. Well, what you heard from the president today was a clear articulation of the stakes. This is about the future of the liberal world order, and we have to stand firm. So you're paying more in gas because it's the future of the liberal world order. Your Excellency, are you ready for a new world order? I think, uh, Becky, the, pro the main problem is uh, if you think of the technology, the technology is 21st century 22nd century technology, what is happening in AI, what is happening uh, everywhere, really. My mentor on issues of world order is Henry Kissinger, so I'll try to channel him, and forgive me, Dr. Kissinger. But his answer would be, what do you mean no new world order? We have not had a world order yet. Hmm. What we've had is we've had a Western order that was imposed on the world. And so the first world order in modern times, or somewhat modern times, was four centuries ago with the, with the Treaty of Westphalia. If you look at what we're trying to create right now, uh, where I would say at an inflection point in history, as important as the end of World War I, where we got the effort at world order tragically wrong, uh, we ended up with millions of dead, the Holocaust, in World War II. After World War II, we got it more right than wrong with the creation of the International Liberal Order and the United Nations. And, uh, but China grew. China uh, certainly uh, took uh, full advantage of being part of the global system. Uh, Russia did not. Russia became more of an outlier. And I think where we are now, and this gets to your question, Becky, of a new world order, is uh, it can go in two directions with the war in Ukraine now being a decisive element. World leaders have stepped up their attacks on China and Russia. NATO has for the first time in its history labelled China a security threat and its partnership with Russia an attempt to undermine world order. Uh, we've seen a failure of China uh, to condemn any of the Russian aggression that has occurred against Ukraine. Their main concern is that China and Russia are moving too close together and undermining Western values. NATO, for the first time in its history, sees China as a growing threat. The People's Republic of China's malicious hybrid and cyber operations target allies and harm alliance security and warns the deepening strategic partnership between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation attempts to undercut the rules-based international order. It's a major shift in focus. Tensions between the United States and China are now rising. President Biden declaring on the world stage that the U.S. would defend Taiwan if China were to invade. Hello, China's defense minister has issued a stark warning. Foreign interference in Taiwan is, quote, doomed to fail. China's defense minister, Wei Fenghe, has warned that any attempt to bring about Taiwan's independence will trigger a fight to the end. After a Chinese fighter jet aggressively targeted an Australian surveillance aircraft over the deeply contested South China Sea. A chilling confrontation in the skies over the disputed South China Sea. Accusing Canadian pilots of provocation and warning of dire consequences. China is defiant in the face of criticism over its increasingly aggressive and dangerous tactics targeting Five Eyes planes in international airspace. China's actions are irresponsible and provocative. One third of the world's shipping carrying six trillion dollars worth of goods passes through the South China Sea each year, a waterway where Beijing has illegally occupied and militarized a series of small islands. This is a body of water which is deeply connected to Australia because of our trade which goes through there. And this isn't a case of a single pilot hot dogging. Sources say there have been approximately 60 intercepts since Christmas and nearly half of those have been dangerous. Over the South China Sea when it was intercepted by a Chinese J-16 jet fighter which drew very close alongside and released flares. The warplane then accelerated, cut in front of the RAF jet and deployed a cloud of aluminium strips known as chaff, some of which entered the Australian plane's engines. 
China says the island's reunification with the mainland is inevitable. We will resolutely crush any attempt to pursue Taiwanese independence. Let me make this clear. If anyone dares to secede Taiwan from China, we will not hesitate to fight. We will fight at all costs and we will fight to the end. This is the only choice for China. But today, Biden was clear the U.S. would be involved militarily. It's a step he's been unwilling to take to protect Ukraine against Russia, but something he now says he would do to protect Taiwan against China. We'll dislocate the entire region and be another action similar to what happened in, in, uh, in Ukraine. And so it's a, it's a burden that is even stronger. In the room, Biden's advisors appeared shocked. The White House quickly insisting there is no change in policy while trying not to contradict the president. It's very, very clear that from America's perspective, China is now the biggest competitor on all fronts. And as a result of that, what America is doing now is building alliances across the world. And in 2022, we all know we're living in a vortex of crises, whether it's a pandemic that has killed some 18 million people worldwide, uh, the largest war in Europe since World War II, uh, the challenge to supply lines that has uh, disrupted everything from computer chips to baby food, um, the highest rate of inflation you know, in decades, and of course, that existential crisis called climate change. So we're living not just in a perfect storm, but kind of in a, in a I don't know, pluperfect super, uh, super storm. So my five headlines. The first is that um, globalization is unraveling. It is changing the kind of interdependence we have experienced around the world. And just to give you an example, Russian shit makes a difference to Brazil's economy. That Brazil is one of the largest exporters of uh, agricultural products in the world, the largest amount of soybeans. But it depends for fertilizer on manure from Russia. So what happens, you know, we all know about grain. We've all read about how the supply lines, 30 or 40 percent, I think, of, of grain comes from uh, Ukraine and Russia. This affects, this affects particularly uh, the Middle East. So the kind of fabric, the assumptions we all made about the global interdependence of countries, of continents, has begun to unravel. And we're beginning to see what I call a kind of regionalization and a rule-less system of smuggling and trade to try to accommodate. Globalization was never properly ruled. We kind of evolved with its own steam, who made what connections, what was profitable, uh, and now we're finding um, the consequences. Uh, I think globalization is still you know, the trend of the 21st century, but we're going to have to go about it with more rules, more of a sense of what the order really is. And the problem is that those countries that are in the middle of democracy or autocracy, uh, kind of stuck in the middle, are tilting ever more toward autocracies. And when you look at the issue of leadership, of who's giving the leadership to kind of push us in the right direction, Joe Biden's numbers are sinking, Boris Johnson's numbers are tanking, Macron no longer has a majority government, um, Italy is in a state of uncertainty and divided over what to do about uh, Ukraine, um, and Germany's facing a severe economic and energy recession, uh, at, which in some ways we're, we're all going to be facing. Uh, I don't like paying for $6 gas either. Um, so my fourth trend is that we're facing a new nuclear age. You know, we kind of all thought with the end of World War II, yes, there was an arms race, and yes, there was development and proliferation of the nuclear weapon. Um, but we're, we're entering a new age. And on, on this, Bill and I profoundly disagree, so be forewarned. Uh, but uh, North Korea is on the verge of a new nuclear test, which will be the first in five years. Iran is now 8.5 days away from being able to enrich enough uranium to fuel a bomb. Now don't worry, it takes two other very complicated steps to actually make a bomb, and Iran has not made the political decision. But the fact is we could be in for you know, a wave of proliferation. The Iran nuclear deal is in profound trouble. There's a last ditch attempt to um, save it, but the, the challenge today is also not just from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki type bombs, 
The real challenge, which most Americans don't fully understand, is from the smaller scale tactical nuclear weapon that has a range of 300 um, miles, 500 clicks, uh, because we don't have any country near us that has a tactical nuclear weapon. But Russia has specialized in them. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had an eight to one advantage in nuclear weapons over uh, the Soviet Union. Today, Russia has a 10 to one uh, advantage over us when it comes to nukes. And so I think it's something that we have to actually think about or be conscious of that, uh, and there's been a lot of talk about will Putin you know, use a tactical nuclear weapon, which you don't have to use on the ground. You can use in the air to disrupt communications. You can use it even higher in the, in the atmosphere to disrupt uh, satellite communications, which control you know, our cell phones, you know, all the things we use. So, and I think where we are now, and this gets to your question, Becky, of a new world order, is uh, it can go in two directions with the war and Ukraine now being a decisive element. Either the jungle is back, as the historian Bob Kagan talks, and, and that we can go into a darker era, um, or we could go into an era because of the advances of science, advances of technology, that could be one of the most prosperous, promising, progressive, enlightened, moderate, modern eras that we've ever faced. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in a moment where that's being decided. I wrote a piece in late October saying we're already in World War III. We are already in conflict that extends so far beyond Ukraine, actually, mm -hmm. even within the context of Western Europe. But we've clearly been pretty much at war in space. Uh, below the surface of the oceans, submarine warfare between superpowers. Uh, I wouldn't even say that this has been happening for at least four years, and it's spilled over into public view on the ground. Uh, but we don't frame it that way. Uh, also, this idea that it's one kind of uh, political organization system versus another, but really it looks to me like old-fashioned superpower conflicts. Um, where I'm very optimistic, and I agree with you about how to frame the future, what I see as someone involved in technology, someone involved with entrepreneurs and advising governments, I see a future where we genuinely have ubiquity and not scarcity. I see a future where the internet is available for free for mm -hmm. everyone in the most remote locations on the planet, for example. And that means the location of power is going to shift. And I see, as a person in financial markets, decentralization of power structures everywhere, in finance, in political power. Um, and in fact, this conflict that we're in right now may be the beginning of that shift.